you've really opened up a door into where we are in Torah right now and where the Israelites are in Torah right now. They are in an in-between place. They, they have left Egypt, but they really don't know what to expect. They are frightened. They're anxious. They're fearful. They're angry. Their fear has caused them to create all kinds of false narratives about what really is. They cannot see the truth. As I said last week, they can only see through a glass darkly. They're letting their fear dictate their narrative rather than uh, the truth of what is. And by the way, since you mentioned it, Leslie, I, I would like to share with you guys a wonderful book that I read that has to do with accepting what is one of the best books or maybe just because of the timing of it when I read it. Um, now I'm hoping I can remember the name of the author. In any event, it's called A Thousand Names for Joy. And um, and the woman who wrote it is the wife of Stephen Mitchell, who is an amazing interpreter. He's done Hebrew to English interpretations of some of the Psalms, of parts of the book of Job, uh, and other holy books. He's translated the I Ching. Um, I can't remember her name. Um, it's, but her first name is Brian. It is a woman and her first name is Brian and it's called A Thousand Names yeah, for Joy. In any event, she is a, a wonderful um, storyteller and she gives all kinds of examples about how to accept what is and live in the moment, even though you can live reflectively and intelligently. And um, and that fighting what is, fighting the reality of what is, is what causes all of our suffering. Um, it was really a life-changing book for me. So life-changing that I forgot the name of the author. But thank you, you guys. Byron Katie. And she is the wife of Stephen Mitchell. And he's other another extraordinary author and translator. So that brings us up to, um, to what I wanted to talk just for a minute or two about my teaching for tomorrow. We're in Parshat Korach. Korach was the person who led a rebellion against uh, Moshe and Aaron. And uh, we presume that he was articulate. Articulate. We know that he was very influential. He was um, basically the head of uh, the family that included Moshe and Aaron and Miriam, a different branch, uh, the branch of Kohat. And his duties, as well as all the other Kohathites, were to take care of the most holy items in the Mishkan and go into the holiest places, not into the Holy of Holies, of course. That was only somewhere that the Kohen Gadol could go once a year. But other than the Kohen Gadol and the Kohanim, his duties were the most important, the most holy, and in the most holy places. But yet, that wasn't enough for him. And uh, so I really want to explore why it wasn't enough for him. Um, and I'm going to do that in, in a couple different ways. Um, psychologically, very often, if somebody's very close to power or very close to achieving something or having something, they feel the lack more acutely than, than someone who's very far away from it, uh, that a person in whom there's not the possibility of it becoming a reality. So why is that? Why is it in our nature that, um, that even though we have 99% of something, some of us just pine after the 1% that we're lacking? And our sages teach us that not only Korach was that way, but we know that Haman was that way that everyone bowed down to Haman. He was second in command only to Ahasuerus, the king, but that was not enough for him. The fact that Mordecai did not bow down to him got in the way of every other thing that he had accomplished, every other privilege that he was given, every other honor that he was given, and he could not see beyond the fact that Mordecai did not bow down to him. So very similar to Korach. And in fact, we're taught, do not be like Korach, for that reason, obviously, do not be like Haman. Haman was an Amalekite, but do not be like Korach. Uh, and our sages tell us through the verses in Perkei Avot, which is a part of the Mishnah, that um, we should only make arguments for the sake of heaven. 
They don't really define what that means though, and I'm gonna go into that in detail tomorrow. But they do give examples. The sages that gave arguments for the sake of heaven, well, they say that's like Hillel and Shammai and the house of Hillel and house of Shammai. Who did not make arguments for the sake of heaven? That is Korach, and it is our Parsha that is the prime example of that, making arguments not for the sake of heaven. And I'll just share one little midrash. I've been doing that on Friday nights. Um, so there's a funny midrash involving Korah that he comes and confronts Moshe uh, about this whole idea of having one blue thread um, as part of your uh, tzitzit. So what he does basically, and what the midrash teaches us is that he sets up these examples just to ask a question that are gotcha questions. Now we're familiar with that because we either watch or read the news and we know very often when people get uh, interviewed that they're asked certain questions that can lead them into an embarrassing answer or an answer that they can't find their way out of. We call them gotcha questions. Well, this is exactly what Korach is doing with Moshe. He says, for example, um, what if there's a talus that's made entirely of tehillit? Is it exempt from having the blue thread on the tzitzit? And Moses says, no, it's not exempt. It requires the blue thread in the tzitzit. Then he gives another example. Well, consider a house full of sacred books. Does it need a mezuzah? And Moshe says, yes, it needs a mezuzah. And Korach said to him, the entire Torah consisting of 275 sections does not exempt a house, but one section does. And he continued with his, this confrontational argument. You were not commanded concerning these matters. You made these rulings up yourself. And he basically made a judgment on Moshe that he didn't know what he was talking about. But these are examples not only of arguments not made for the sake of, of heaven, but arguments made for the sake of just trying to outwit somebody else. So there's not truth, there's not learning, there's not goodness, there's not curiosity involved here as a motivation just to either try to catch somebody out or humiliate them. So tomorrow I'm gonna to teach some more about that and 